It's such a great honor to be here, um, to join you all to talk about independent media. I also um, want to thank uh, Makiko Nakano of Democracy Now! in Japan, my colleague Dennis Moynihan, who just stood up, who is, works with me at Democracy Now! and is co-author of the, our last two books, uh, the latest, Silenced Majority and Breaking the Sound Barrier. Um, and Sophia University, uh, who invited me to come and speak. How many of you know Democracy Now!, listen to or watch or read Democracy Now!, well, it's fantastic to see that and I hope you all tell your friends and uh, your foes uh, to tune in because it is a program that encourages debate. I originally began at Pacifica Radio. Um, Pacifica was founded in 1949 in Berkeley, California by a war resistor, a conscientious objector named Lou Hill. When he came out of the detention camps, he said there has to be a media outlet that is not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. As George Gerbner, uh, Dean of Journalism at the University of Pennsylvania, founder of the Cultural Environment Movement said, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And so Pacifica was born. First station KPFA in Berkeley, 49. In 1959, KPFK in Los Angeles, my station in New York in 1960, WBAI, station in Washington, and in 1970, uh, a sta station in Houston, Texas called KPFT in the Petro Metro, uh, that's Houston, uh, oil country. Now, that station is very interesting because in its first months of operation, KPFT is the only radio station to be blown up. It was uh, the Ku Klux Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. Now, the silver lining was it's not as if Pacific had money for advertising. It certainly blew it into the consciousness of the potential listening audience of the people of Houston. And when they got back on their feet, um, the Klan blew it up again. They strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter. Um, I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops. Those are the titles of the leaders of the KKK, uh, the Grand Wizard. But he said it was his proudest act. I think that's because he understood how dangerous independent media is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it is Habakasha from Hiroshima or a U.S. soldier who comes home from war psychologically or physically wounded, not to mention those who he or she may wound. To hear those voices, there is nothing more powerful than to hear someone speaking for themselves. I really do think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, it's wielded as a weapon of war, and that has to change. What we get on the networks in the United States is the small circle of pundits who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. No, we have to go into the communities of our countries and hear from those that are hailed as experts on the different issues, not the media appointed heroes or leaders, but those that people turn to in their own communities to hear their voices. And for those who are struggling to tell their stories until they can tell their own. Now, I think the embedding process has brought the media to an all-time low. Now, I don't know how many of you know that term. It's very big in the United States. You know, it was invented by the Pentagon, the whole idea of embedding reporters in the front lines of troops, like in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, I'm not saying these reporters aren't brave. They are. But what are you going to get from that perspective? You get reporting from the trigger end. We need reporting from the target end as well. What does it feel like to be in an Iraqi hospital in an Afghan community? 
What about embedding reporters in the peace movement around the world to understand the full effects of war? The media has failed us miserably. I mean, just look at the US coverage of the Iraq war. I'm going to give a quick example. Um, six weeks before the invasion of Iraq in February 2003, that's when Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, gave his push for war at the United Nations, which a speech that was the nail in the coffin for so many because he had been hesitant about war. And when he said that the evidence is in on weapons of mass destruction, um, it convinced many people. So a media watch group called FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, did a study of the two weeks around Powell's push for war. Now, this is a critical time. It's six weeks before the US invades. And it's the time when the media is, as Noam Chomsky says, manufacturing consent manufacturing consent for war. Now, half the population was opposed to war. Um, and so they looked at the two weeks around Powell's address. On the four major nightly newscasts, public television and commercial television, there were 393 interviews done around war. Guess how many were with anti-war leaders? This time when about half the population is opposed to war. 393 interviews. Three. Three of almost 400. That is no longer a mainstream media. That's an extreme media beating the drums for war, which is why we have to take the media back. I really do think that those who are concerned about war and peace, those who are concerned about the growing inequality between rich and poor, certainly it's the worst it's ever been in the United States, and it's growing around the world. Those who are concerned about climate change, about global warming, which doesn't just mean that the weather gets hotter. You know, the conservatives in the United States are all mocking the idea of global warming now because they say, you know, when it's zero degrees and uh, negative 50, but talking about Fahrenheit, uh, these crazy folks who talk about climate change, you know, how cold will it have to be for them to understand global warming isn't happening, they say. Of course, it's the opposite. It's about climate disruption, the irregularity in climate that has changed so dramatically as the Earth heats up. But those who are concerned about war, inequality, about climate change, about the fate of the planet, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. And you notice I call it the corporate media, because I don't think the mainstream media is mainstream. Just look at the example of beating the drums for war in Iraq when half the population was opposed, but yet you heard so few of those voices. There might be some similarity in the Japanese press now when it comes to the anti-nuclear movement, those voices we went the other night to cover the protest in front of the official residence of the prime minister. A couple hundred people were there, very animated. Um, but they represent, according to the polls, the majority of people in Japan. Are you seeing that reflected in the media coverage of nuclear power and whether to revive it and continue it? It is so important we have a media that reflects what's happening at the grassroots and not just a megaphone for those in power. Not to exclude those in power by any means. We need a forum for people to debate each other, right? A president of the United States to debate a former, um, to provide. I see the media as a great force that levels the playing field. You've got the corporations and the government. They play penny. They pay plenty for um, public relations for their spokespeople. The media should not be a megaphone for those in power. We are supposed to be apart from the parties, not a party to them. It's an uncomfortable position that we occupy. In the United States, journalism is the only profession that is explicitly protected by the US Constitution, because we're supposed to be the check and balance on power. Journalism is essential to the functioning of a democratic society. Now, it was a very moving experience to go yesterday to Hiroshima. 
I have been writing about Hiroshima for many, many years. In uh, our first book, I wrote my first three books with my brother David, who is also a journalist. The first book called The Exception to the Rulers. Um, that should be the motto of all the media, The Exception to the Rulers. I mean, our second book is called Static. We called it that because in this high-tech digital age, with high-definition television and digital radio, still all we ever get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths. Well, what we need the media to give us is the dictionary definition of static. Criticism. Opposition. Unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. That's the media that will save us. Now, this idea of reporters embedded with troops goes back. And it goes back to World War II. It goes back to the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, I wanted to talk about two different models of journalism. We wrote a chapter, an exception to the rulers, called Hiroshima Cover-Up, How the War Department's Timesmen Won a Pulitzer. And we began with a quote of a great American muckraking journalist named I.F. Stone. And he said, if you're going to remember two words, remember governments lie. And we are not, as journalists, supposed to act as a conveyor belt for those lies, especially when it comes to war. The lies take lives. I mean, look at the whole issue of weapons of mass destruction. But back to Hiroshima. We write, at the dawn of the nuclear age, an independent Australian journalist named Wilfred Bertret traveled to Japan to cover the aftermath of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. The only problem was that General Douglas MacArthur had declared southern Japan off limits, barring the press. Over 200,000 people died in the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but no Western journalist witnessed the aftermath and told the story. The world's media obediently crowded onto the USS Missouri off the coast of Japan to cover the surrender of the Japanese. Wilfred Burchett decided to strike out on his own. He was determined to see for himself what this nuclear bomb had done to understand what this vaunted new weapon was all about. So he boarded a train and traveled for 30 hours to the city of Hiroshima in defiance of General MacArthur's orders. Burchett emerged from the train into a nightmare world. The devastation that confronted him was unlike any he had ever seen during the war. The city of Hiroshima, with a population of 350,000, had been razed. Multi-story buildings reduced to charred posts. He saw people's shadows seared into walls and sidewalks. He met people with their skin melting off. In the hospital, he saw patients with purple skin hemorrhages, gangrene, fever, rapid hair loss. Burchett was among the first to witness and describe radiation sickness. He sat down in the rubble with his Hermes typewriter. His dispatch began, in Hiroshima, 30 days after the first atomic bomb destroyed the city and shook the world, people are still dying mysteriously and horribly, people who were uninjured in the cataclysm from an unknown something which I can only describe as the atomic plague, he wrote. He continued tapping out the words that still haunt us to this day. Hiroshima does not look like a bombed city. It looks as if a monster steamroller has passed over it and squashed it out of existence. I write these facts as dispassionately as I can in the hope that they will act as a warning to the world, he wrote. Burchett's article, headlined The Atomic Plague, was published September 5, 1945, in the London Daily Express. The story caused a worldwide sensation. Burchett's candid reaction to the horror shocked readers. In this first testing ground of the atomic bomb, I've seen the most terrible and frightening desolation in four years of war. It makes a blitzed Pacific Island seem like an Eden. The damage is far greater than photographs can show. Burchett's searing independent reportage was a public relations fiasco for the U.S. government and the military. 
General MacArthur had gone to great pains to restrict journalists' access to the bomb cities, and military censors were sanitizing, even killing dispatches that described the horror. There was a reporter, George Weller, who got in with the Chicago Daily News to Nagasaki. He wrote a 25,000-word story on the nightmare he found there. He talked about disease X. He, too, didn't have a word for radiation sickness. He just knew he saw something he had never seen before. But he made a crucial error. He submitted his piece to the military censors. His newspaper never got the story. As Weller later summarized his experience with McCarter's censors, they won, he said. U.S. authorities responded in time-honored fashion to Burchett's revelations. They attacked the messenger. General MacArthur ordered him expelled from Japan. Uh, he would later get his, uh, the order was later rescinded. His camera with photos of Hiroshima mysteriously vanished when he was in the hospital. U.S. officials accused Burchett of being influenced by Japanese propaganda. The U.S. military scoffed at the notion of an atomic sickness, and so they invited reporters the U.S. military, to come to New Mexico, to the original test bomb site, to prove that there was no radiation, problem with radiation. Foremost among those reporters who were there was William Lawrence, the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the New York Times, the leading science reporter in the United States. Groves trusted Lawrence to convey the military's line, and the general was not disappointed. Lawrence's front page story said, U.S. atom bomb site belies Tokyo tales. Tests on New Mexico range confirmed blast, not radiation, took toll. Interestingly, just a side note, the driver who drove Groves and the reporters and stood in the crater for being photographed by all these reporters later died of leukemia, and he was granted um, uh, service-connected disability payments acknowledging he had died of radiation sickness. Just a side tale. Lawrence quoted General Groves, the Japanese claim people died from radiation. If this is true, the number was very small. He said at the beginning, uh, the Japanese described symptoms that simply did not ring true. William Lawrence went on to write a 10-part series for the New York Times. He won the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. Oh, I forgot to mention that it turns out William Lawrence was not only receiving a salary from the New York Times, he was also on the payroll of the War Department, what was the original name for the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, interestingly, War Department is now called. In March 45, General Groves had held a secret meeting at the New York Times with Lawrence to offer him a job writing press releases for the Manhattan Project, the U.S. program to develop atomic weapons. The intent, according to the Times, was to explain the intricacies of the atom bomb's operation principles in layman's language. Lawrence also helped write statements on the bomb for President Truman and Secretary of War Stimson on the payroll of both. He won the Pulitzer Prize for this. Uh, a few years ago, uh, David and I wrote a letter to the Pulitzer Committee, and I delivered it to Columbia University, where I trained many of the journalism students at the Columbia Journalism School, where the Pulitzer Committee is housed, delivered that letter that said that the New York Times and William Lawrence posthumously should be stripped of that Pulitzer. It is not a model of reporting that we want to continue. It is absolutely critical that we be separate from the state, that we report on what the state is doing. Interestingly, one other side note here, just coming from Kyoto a few hours ago. When Secretary of War Henry Stimson was handed the target list of uh, cities to bomb. He was going to choose which ones. He immediately crossed off Kyoto. Why? Because he and Mrs. Stimson had visited Kyoto. And it was a beautiful city, he said. He loved the people, the food, the temples. He could not destroy that city. Think about how profound that is. I mean, if only the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki got to host the Stimpsons. But think of that lesson for the media, that if you know a place, if you've spoken to the people, if you've heard their voices, if you've tasted their food, it makes you much less likely to want to destroy it. That's the power of media. It introduces us to each other. It conveys a humanity in understanding what you think, even if I don't agree with the thing that you say. You know, how often do we agree with our family members? But we come to understand where you're coming from, and it makes it much less likely that people would want to destroy each other. 
I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. Now, I know that we uh, want to open this, uh, this up to a discussion, Q&A, but I just wanted to end um, with coverage of East Timor, because I think it's also a very important message for the press. On the issue, by the way, of Fukushima, I think it is so significant um, that when you look at Japan today, Japan, the example, um, the fatal example of the dawn of the nuclear age and what this development of nuclear weapons led to was nuclear power and now being a victim of that. Um, it is so important that we hear the voices of the people most affected. Whether we're talking about 1945 and yesterday, I was toured through the area Ground Zero in Hiroshima by a Habakasha, an 86-year-old man. When we got to the museum, he said, wait, 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 wait. Before you go inside, please just stand here. I said, well, but don't we want to go inside the museum? He said, no, I want you to stand here. He said, because people lived here. They lived here. And he showed me the rubble. And he said, those are posts for houses. That's China. People had in their houses. He said, understand people lived here. This isn't just about history. To hear his voice would change anyone. And so let me end by talking about East Timor. Most of you probably know briefly the story of East Timor. In the United States, if you asked an audience, most would have no idea, even though we are so, in the United States, intimately connected to East Timor. East Timor is this island nation, you know, which um, was occupied by the Portuguese for hundreds of years. Um, but then they pulled out in 1974, and in 1975, Indonesia invaded East Timor. Not before, it was December 7, 1975, President Ford and Henry Kissinger, then Secretary of State, visited Suharto in Jakarta and gave the go-ahead for the invasion. It was very important for Suharto because he didn't want to lose aid from the United States and military weapons, and if he engaged in an offensive act, he was afraid he would. So for the President and Secretary of State to give that approval meant that the bilateral relationship could continue. So as Ford and Kissinger flew out to meet with Marcos in the Philippines, the Indonesian military flew in. And by land, by air, and by sea, the Indonesian military invaded East Timor December 7, 1975. They closed East Timor to the outside world. 90% of their weapons were from the United States. The US armed, financed, and trained the Indonesian military. They closed the country to the outside world, the Indonesian military did, and the slaughter commenced. One of the great slaughters of the late 20th century. Um, for the next 17 years, in the US press and the corporate networks and the nightly news, the words East Timor were never mentioned, even though it was one of the great genocides of the second half of the 20th century. We certainly knew about Cambodia. Because the U.S., because the president, secretary of state, you know, Pol Pot was an enemy of the United States, and they would talk about it, and so the press would dutifully report. No, they should have. They should have reported on Pol Pot's atrocities. But when it came to Indonesia, Indonesian president was an ally of the United States. So the president of the United States and the secretary of state would rarely talk about what was happening, certainly wouldn't talk about Timor, and so the press didn't either. So over the next 17 years, the Indonesian military killed off a third of the population in East Timor, 200,000 people, proportionately larger than what happened in, uh, in Cambodia. I got a chance to go to Timor in 1990 and 1991 with my colleague, a very brave journalist named Alan Nairn. 
1991, we got there at the end of October, and we went to the main Catholic church in Dili, uh, the capital of East Timor. You know, Timor is about 300 miles above Australia. And the women were wailing, and I didn't know if it was the standard sorrow of Timor or if something had happened. And we learned after the mass that the Indonesian military had surrounded the church, shot into it, and killed a young man named Sebastio Gomez. His blood was still fresh on the steps. The next day, they held a funeral for Sebastio, presided over by Bishop Carlos Jimenez Bello, who later won the Nobel Peace Prize with José Ramos Horta, who would then become president of Timor. Um, they held a mass and a funeral for him, and um, a thousand people marched to the cemetery. It was astounding to see. This is the end of October 1991. People putting their hands up in the V sign, shouting, Viva East Timor, Viva Independence, Viva Sebastiao. I mean, most of them didn't know who this young man was. But the idea that the Indonesian military had violated the last civilian institution allowed to stand, you know, no unions could exist, uh, there were no um, places where people could gather except in their churches and that last bastion had now been violated. And I mean, this was a country where there was no freedom of press, no freedom of assembly, no freedom of speech, and the people simply marched. And they got to the cemetery. They buried Sebastio, terrified but exhilarated. We went around the country after that, waiting for a delegation that was supposed to come from the UN for the first time investigating this situation, the human rights situation. And we then learned that the Portuguese delegation authorized by the UN would not come. We later learned it was at the behest of the United States. For the first time, word would get out about what was happening in Timor. So two weeks later, when people were in total despair, because so many young people had gathered in the churches, dropped out of school and work, left their homes because they wanted the protection of the church so they could speak to the delegation. They had risked their lives to do this, but now they had no protection. Where do they go? Because the delegation wasn't going to come. So then came the morning of November 12th. We had gone around the country in asking people how were, was the Indonesian military preparing for the delegation. Everywhere we heard the same story. They said that the Indonesian military told them, if you speak to the delegation, we'll kill you after they leave. The line most commonly used, says Bishop Bello, will kill your family to the seventh generation. A nationwide death threat was issued. Two weeks after Sebastian was killed, after the funeral, the people held a commemoration procession. They went to mass in the morning. It was 8 o'clock. It was so many people at the Catholic Church, they had to hold the mass outside. And then 1,000 people came out of the church, and thousands more joined them, the kids in their Catholic school uniforms pulling out uh, banners that were written on bed sheets. And you'd see marching down the street of Dili a girl in her Catholic school uniform holding one end of the banner and an old woman in her traditional Timorese garb. And the banners would say, why the UN, um, not, you know, they would say things like, why the Indonesian military shoot our church, and um, they appealed to the United Nations to stop the slaughter, and they marched through the streets of Dili, through this geography of pain. Whether they were passing a military base where Timorese were captured and killed, or whether they were passing a hotel where Timorese were imprisoned at the back, and they held up their hands in the V-sign. When they got to the cemetery, it's about 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm speaking very fast, and I apologize to the translators, but I know that we have very little time. Um, we were talking to people at the cemetery, and we asked them, why? Why are you um, protesting? Why are you risking your lives? And they would say, for my mother, for my brother, for my sister, for my village, it was wiped out. And then from the direction the procession came, hundreds of Indonesian military in uniform, their USM-16s at the ready position. It looked very threatening. And we knew the Indonesian military had committed many massacres in the past, but they'd never done it in front of Western journalists. And we thought maybe if we made ourselves, if we came to the front and made it clear who we were, it could head off the attack. I'd always hidden my equipment because we knew that Timorese would be in danger if they were caught talking to Western journalists. But now I took it out. I slung the tape recorder over my shoulder. I put headphones on. I held up my microphone like a flag. Alan put the camera above his head. We walked to the front of the crowd, the soldiers marching up 12 to 15 abreast. The people could not escape. There were high walls on either side of the road. Only people at the very back could run away. <laughs> 
and the soldiers swept past us. They came around the corner without any warning, without any hesitation, without any provocation. They opened fire on the crowd, gunning people down from right to left. The first to go down, a little boy behind us with his hands up and the V sign exploded from the gunfire. Uh, a group of soldiers came at us. They grabbed my microphone, waving it in my face as if to say, this is what we don't want. And then they threw me to the ground, beating me with their rifle butts and their boots. Alan got a photograph of them opening fire on the crowd. Um, and then he threw himself on top of me to protect me from further injury. And they took their USM-16s like baseball bats, and they slammed them against his skull until they fractured it. We were laying on the ground. He was covered in blood. The soldiers joined in uh, firing squad fashion, putting the guns to our heads, about 12 of them, and then more joined. And they were shouting two things. They were shouting politique and Australia. Politique, they were saying it was political that we were there. But that's our job as journalists, to go to where the silence is. And they were shouting Australia. They wanted to know if we were from Australia. We knew how dangerous that was. Because there were five Australian-based journalists covering the events leading up to the invasion in 1975 uh, in a place called Balibo. And the Indonesian military caught them, and they lined them up against a house, and they executed them. The final journalist, Roger East, was in a radio station in Dili the day after the invasion, December 8, 1975. And they broke into the radio station. They dragged him out. And as he shouted, he's from Australia. They shot him into the harbor with so many thousands of Timorese. The Australian government hardly protested the killing of their journalists. We believe because years later, Australia and Indonesia would sign the Timor Gap Treaty, dividing up Timor's oil between Australia and Indonesia. Oil is the source of so much pain in the world. So as we lay on the ground, Alan covered in blood, we, we shouted back, no, we're from America, America. They'd kick me in the stomach when I'd get my breath back because more would join in this firing line. I'd shout, America, America. Threw my passport at them. I was born in Washington, D.C. Um, they'd stripped us now of everything. It's the only thing I had left. And at some point, they did decide to pull the guns from our heads. We believed because we were from the same country their weapons were from. They would have to pay a price for killing us that they had never had to pay for killing the Timorese, and they moved on. A Red Cross jeep pulled up. We got into it. They picked up an old man who was beaten into a sewer ditch behind him. Every time he put up his hands in the prayer sign, they would the Indonesian soldiers would take the butts of their rifles and smash his face. And the Red Cross driver picked him up, put him in the vehicle. We went into the vehicle. And then as we drove off to the hospital, dozens of Timorese jumped on top of the vehicle, hung off of the spare tire at the back, jumped on top of us. We drove as a human mass to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the doctors and nurses started to cry when they saw us. Why? I think because of what we represent to the Timorese, and I don't just mean Alan and I, I, I mean, and I don't just mean Americans, but people from the most powerful countries, I think represent two things to them, the shield and the sword. The sword, because all too often, at least with the United States, the US uses weapons like in Afghanistan and Iraq or provides weapons to human rights abusing regimes. But they also see the populations of our countries as the shield. You know, they do everything they can do. They get gunned down. We can just call a Congress member and say, please stop doing this or supporting a human rights abusing regime. And they saw that shield bloodied that day. The Indonesian military killed more than 270 people on that day, and it wasn't one of the larger massacres. We went into hiding, tried to figure out what to do, got someone to take pictures of us. They had confiscated everything from us, but just those pictures, even if they would deny that a massacre took place, what happened to us? And I hid those, uh, the film. We made our way to the airport, not before we went to the bishop's residence. Many were taking refuge there, and the bishop helped me clean up Alan. His head was just a glistening bathing cap kind of of blood under his black hair. His shirt was covered in blood. He, the bishop gave him a new shirt. And we thought if we could get to the airport before the blood came down again, maybe we could make our way into the only plane um, that was going out that day. We got to the airport. There was a big commotion. The military runs the airport. They were deciding what to do with us. Maybe there was a gap in communication. Maybe they'd already decided not to kill us, and they wanted us out. 
but we made our way into the plane, the military walking alongside as we tried to get into this plane. Alan was so damaged, he was had electrical shocks going through his body. We didn't want them to see he had been so hurt, and so I kept stopping and saying, I just want to take one last look at this beautiful country before we leave. I had wrapped Alan's bloody shirt under a towel around my waist. If they denied anything happened, what's this? And so we flew from East Timor to West Timor to, um, to uh, Bali, to Denpasar, and there made the call to the Western world that a massacre had taken place and then made our way to the United States. Um, held a news conference in the National Press Club, explained what had taken place and that US weapons were used. And a nationwide movement grew up in the United States called the East Timor Action Network to stop the support of these, uh, this murderous regime and what it was doing, that the US was facilitating it. In 1999, the people of East Timor got to vote for their freedom. Overwhelmingly, in a UN referendum, they voted to be independent. For three years, the UN ran them, and in 2002, they became a new nation. Uh, I had uh, tried to get in to cover the referendum, and the Indonesian military caught me twice in Denpasar and Jakarta and deported me, but Alan did get in. And then 2002, on that day, May 20th, 2002, we did get in to cover Independence Day, the birth of a nation. How often does that happen? It was in a place called Tasitolo, just outside Dili. 100,000 Timorese gathered, and it was just about midnight. Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General, gave a speech, and then Shanana Gushmal, the rebel leader of Timor, long imprisoned by the Indonesian military, the founding president of a new Timor, got up and spoke in many different languages and unfurled the flag of a democratic republic of East Timor. There was this fireworks display, and you could see the light reflected in the tear-stained faces of the people of East Timor. They had resisted, and they had won at an unbelievably high price, at an unacceptably high price, a third of the population gone. But they had prevailed. And they thank people, particularly from Western nations, who had told their governments to stop arming the Indonesian occupying force. And they are a lesson to us, I thought that night as I looked out on the crowd. Whether we are journalists or business people, artists, teachers, professors, students, employed or unemployed, they are a lesson to us every day whether we want to represent the sword or the shield. Democracy now. Out of God.